Hi everyone, and welcome again to Nettle, the go-to place to learn about business, finance, economics, and much, much more. Please don't forget to subscribe to our channel and click that bell notification button below so that you never miss fresh videos and tutorials you might be interested in. Many thanks to our current Patreon supporters and YouTube members for making this video possible, and we would also greatly appreciate if you consider supporting us as well. So click the link in the description or click the join button below for more details. My name is Saba, and today we're investigating a quite peculiar behavioral calendar market anomaly, which is the daylight savings anomaly first discovered and documented by Kamstra et al. in their famous 2000 American Economic Review paper. The daylight savings anomaly is associated with a daylight savings practice, where most countries in the world shift their clocks one hour forward and back to take the most advantage of the changing daylight hours over the course of the year. Most countries that practice daylight savings in the Northern Hemisphere, they do switch their clocks one hour forward in spring and uh, switch them one hour back in the autumn. So again, spring forward, fall back, that's a very common um, mnemonic in the US for the daylight savings practice. And uh, again, it's most common to uh, switch the hours one hour forward in around April or late March and uh, switch them one hour back around October or November. In the US, the practice has been quite universal since 1967 when the uh, official Daylight Saving Act has passed through Congress. Uh, other countries, uh, most notably European countries, also practicing similar uh, daylight saving schedule, although they are different in terms of which weeks the clocks are shifted. However, in the US, the practice has been uh, evolving since 1967, um, most notably uh, autumn and spring daylight savings uh, times uh, have changed quite a bit over the course of the years. In autumn, uh, until 2006, the last Sunday in October was the daylight savings weekend. Again, most of the time, the clocks are shifted um, in Sunday night time so that the change in hours does not affect uh, work schedules that much. So it's almost always weekends when those practices are observed. Uh, since 2007, though, it has been moved to the first Sunday in November. For spring, uh, daylight savings, uh, there has been two changes. Until 1986, it was the last Sunday in April. Uh, between 1987 and 2006 inclusive, uh, it was uh, the first Sunday in April. And uh, since 2007, it is the second Sunday in March, when the clocks are moved one hour forward. And uh, we need to also uh, keep in mind that in 1974, due to the uh, energy crisis and the uh, increase in um, energy prices uh, uh, in 1974, there were no daylight savings observed. Uh, what is the essence of the daylight savings anomaly and why it can be relevant for stock markets? Well, there can be a very uh, intuitive and theoretically motivated behavioral finance hypothesis uh, originating from the daylight savings practice that when the uh, official clocks shift, the biological clocks of people do not shift immediately. And uh, people can be uh, quite uh, affected by it in terms of attention spans, in terms of their mood, in terms of their uh, efficiency. And uh, as um, investors might be uh, affected as well, uh, shortly after the daylight savings uh, time shifts are practiced, they can perform not to the best of their capacity. Again, attention spans can be affected, they can be uh, less optimistic, and they can make mistakes. And uh, that would mean that you could expect, if this behavioral finance uh, hypothesis is true, and there is some support uh, for it from the psychology and physiology literature, you could uh, hypothesize that the returns shortly after daylight savings is implemented, so on the first trading day after the daylight savings Sunday, returns on the stock market can be expected to be lower. And that's what Kamstra et al. indeed documented. So today we'll use the data on S&P 500 from 1967 until year-end 2022 to investigate whether that's indeed true or not. 
and how well did the original uh, Kamsutel findings that we're using data up until 1997 stand the test of time? Is the anomaly still here after the publication of the original article? And we'll also use some quite ingenious um, date functions in Excel to correctly map our data onto daylight savings weekends. So first of all, let's calculate daily uh, S&P 500 log returns, calculate the natural logarithm of the ratio of consecutive index values in the force niche route. Then some simple uh, date functions will allow us to calculate the weekday of a particular trading day. Again, we'll use the second return type that um, has Monday being labeled as one and Sunday being labeled as seven. That is uh, the most intuitive way of coding it for this particular application. And we can see that, for example, the 30th of December 1966 was a Friday and the 3rd of um, January 1967 is a Tuesday. Um, that also shows that the stock market is not indeed open for Saturdays and Sundays, quite intuitively. And that means that if the daylight savings practice affects um, stock market returns, we would need to look for the first trading day after the respective Sunday. For the month, it's quite easy. We just apply the month function to the date and uh, the months are labeled from 1 to 12, January to December. Then we need the day of the month. So we just use the day function and apply it to the particular trading date. And we also need the year. So we just use the year function in a very similar manner. What is less intuitive and less straightforward is that we need days in a month. So number of days in this particular month to make sure that we record the last Sunday correctly. And uh, that can be done using a simple template with uh, the number of days in a particular month in non-leap years. We'll take care of leap years separately. And here we can use the VLOOKUP function. We can also use the index function as well, but VLOOKUP would be a little bit more efficient here. Refer to the number of the month. The table here, we need to lock that as well. We need the second column in the template with the number of days, and we need an exact match. So that would take care of non-leap years. For leap years, we can just add a simple correction. If the month is February, and if the year is leap year, again, here we can use the uh, simplistic uh, formula for leap years, as uh, this will be true throughout our lifetimes. If the year is divisible by four, that would be a leap year. Again, that's not exact uh, leap year formula, but it works just fine for the uh, time horizon we're investigating. So if the remainder from the division of the year number onto four is equal to zero, then it's a leap year. And if it's a February, we need to add one day to the number of days in February and zero otherwise. And if it's not a February, it's not affected by leap years to start with, so zero. And we can see that this allows us to quite uh, nicely calculate the number of days in a month. For example, there are 31 days in December, 31 days in January. February 1967 has 28 days because it's a non-leap year. And if we go to 1968, which is the first leap year in our sample, we'll see that there are 29 days in February 1968, which is exactly what we want. And now moving on to less obvious procedures to record first, second and last Sundays of uh, each respective month, we need to use um, a nested if function. So first we need to check whether this trading day follows some Sunday to start with. And that can be uh, easily detected using the weekday. Because if the weekday of this trading day is greater than the weekday of the previous trading day, it means that we are not skipping a Sunday whatsoever. We are still in the same trading week. And that means that there has not been any Sunday whatsoever between those trading days. Then we need to double check if there was a Sunday, whether it's indeed the first Sunday of the month. And that can be done by exploiting the day um, of this particular month. Because if the day of this month minus the weekday is greater or equal to eight, then it would mean that we are not um, skipping the first Sunday of the month. We're skipping some further Sunday. So it would mean that it's not true that it's the first Sunday. And then we need to check whether we 
are indeed skipping a Sunday in this month and not just starting from Monday, Tuesday or Wednesday in a particular month. So we need to check if this expression uh, is positive. If the expression is positive, then we indeed have skipped the first Sunday of the month, which can be potentially a daylight savings weekend and zero otherwise. And then we close the appropriate number of parentheses and enforce it throughout. And we first see quite nicely that the very first um, trading day has indeed been the uh, trading day following the first Sunday of a particular month, here January 1967. Because again, uh, the 3rd of January 1967 is a Tuesday, meaning that the 1st of January 1967 was a Sunday. And it was quite obviously the first Sunday in 1967, so our function recorded it correctly. And we can also double check that the total number of first Sundays is 672, uh, and that is what we expect to see because we've got 56 sample years, and if we time 56 by 12, we've got 672. As every single month contains a first Sunday, this is what you would expect to see, meaning that we have recorded all procedures correctly. For the second Sunday, we simply need to slightly modify this formula so we can copy it across here and change this 8 into a 15 and that 0 into a 7, simply moving one week ahead to record second Sundays. And that also gives 672, meaning that this indeed is a correct way of recording second Sundays of respective months, or at least trading days that follow them. For the last Sunday though, as, as again some months contain four Sundays, some months contain five Sundays, we need to tweak this formula a little bit because we need to double check whether uh, we will be having another Sunday in this month. So if the weekday is greater than the prior weekday, it's still not skipping a Sunday, so zero still, but then we need to check if the day minus the weekday plus seven, so next Sunday, is greater than the number of days in the month, then we return one, which means that we have indeed skipped the last Sunday. And then we need to check that if our day minus the weekday is less than or equal to zero, which means that we would have a Sunday of a previous month there, we also need to put one in and zero otherwise. And that also gives us 672, meaning that we have correctly recorded all last Sundays in all sample months. Then, as a simple control variable for our daylight savings anomaly, we need to keep track of the Monday effect, simply because a lot of trading days following daylight savings weekends would be Mondays. And it's quite well documented that um, over the course of a long time period, especially um, further back in time, like in the 60s and 70s, uh, stock markets uh, used to have um, the Monday effect quite prominent, which means that um, on Mondays, any Mondays, whether they follow daylight savings weekends or not, returns were lower than average. So if we could explain the pattern with just the Monday effect, and uh, we do not need to um, complicate things by introducing the daylight savings anomaly, well, we need to um, keep that in mind. So we need to simply use a NIF function, and if the weekday is one, we return one and zero otherwise. So this is the most prominent control variable we need to include to uh, test the robustness of our daylight savings anomaly. And now, finally, to identify whether a potential trading day follows a daylight savings weekend, we need to code all of those conditions in an Excel function. So first, if the year is 1974, no daylight savings practices were held in this year due to the energy crisis. So zero. If it's not 1974, daylight savings uh, was practiced, but differently in different years. So now we need to take care of autumn daylight savings. First of all, if the year is greater or equal to 2007, autumn daylight savings is practiced first Sunday in November. So we need to 
introduce the first Sunday condition and the November condition. So the month should be equal to 11. Then we need to take care of the autumn daylight savings until 2006. So if the year number is less than or equal to 2006, then it's the last Sunday, so last Sunday condition, in October. So the month should be equal to 10. Then we need to take care of the spring daylight savings. And again, first we do the most recent practice. Since 2007, it's the second Sunday. So second Sunday condition in March. So the month is equal to 3. Then, between 1987 and 2006, so if the year is greater or equal to 1987, and if the year is less than or equal to 2006, we have got the first Sunday, which is this condition, and it's in March, and it's in April, so the month is equal to 4. And finally, until 1986, so if the year is less than or equal to 1986, we do last Sunday, so the last Sunday condition, in April. So the month should be equal to 4. This is quite a bulky formula, but it does um, implement all of the peculiarities of the daylight saving practices in the US since 1967. So we can close this formula, drag it down, and we'll have 109 daylight saving um, days that follow the daylight saving weekends. And we want to test whether the returns on those daylight saving um, following days were lower than otherwise. And we first want to test it on the full sample. So let's regress our returns um, of the S&P 500 onto the dummy variable that takes one if the trading day follows directly a daylight savings weekend and zero otherwise. So we can select a five by two range and apply Linus, regressing all of the daily returns since 1967 onto the daylight savings dummy. And we want one as we want the constant included and one as we want to include the additional statistics and we enforce this function that gives us the coefficient uh, on the daylight savings dummy on minus 0.18%, meaning that returns on daylight savings uh, trading days are 18 basis points lower than otherwise. We can test for the significance of this effect by dividing the coefficient by the respective standard error, and then using a two-tailed t-test, inputting the absolute value of the t-stat and the number of the degrees of freedom given here in the Linus template. And we'll see that in the full sample, the effect is significant at 10%, uh, not overwhelmingly significant, but we haven't controlled for the Monday effect yet. So to control for the Monday effect, we can just copy the Linus function template, put it here, selecting a five by three uh, template, as we do want to include another explanatory variable. And here we include the Monday dummy by selecting the column L as our explanatory variable as well. And as we enforce it, we can carry on forward with the t-test for the daylight savings effect again. And we can see that the magnitude of the coefficient have decreased quite a bit, uh, and the t-stat is now insignificant. So over the full sample, if we control for just the normal Monday effect, there is no significant um, anomaly associated with daylight savings per se. But was the effect more prominent in the original sample Kamstra et al. used? One of their tests was uh, carried out on S&P 500 on the data from the official passage of um, Countrywide Daylight Saving Act until 1997. So we need to know uh, what is the final day of 1997. So let's have a look when 1997 ends in our sample and we'll see that it does end in row 7807. So keeping that in mind, we can change our regression. So for the baseline regression that's not controlling for the Monday effect, we can select again a five by two template and change our final cell to be 7807, both in terms of the dependent variable and explanatory variables. We can see that the coefficient is 
quite a bit higher. It's minus 32 basis points. So the returns on trading days following daylight savings um, are 32 basis points or 0.32% lower than an average, which is quite substantial. And carrying out a t-test, we can see that the result is significant at 1%, was a quite high t-stat of minus 2.73, which is very similar to the one reported by uh, Kamstra et al. for this particular test in the paper. And if we include the Monday effect as a control, so again, just including column L as well as our explanatory variable, we can see that the effect does reduce by quite a bit, but it's still significant at 5%, meaning that the original results were significant. However, what is the out-of-sample performance of the daylight savings anomaly? This has been quite prominent in uh, the literature that followed Kamstra et al. Uh, to highlight how sensitive the effect is to the sample size choice. And, uh, well, this could particular signal either that the result was associated with sample selection bias, so it was just a result of data snooping, or that it is affected by the uh, post-publication decay. So when investors have learned that returns are lower after delayed savings weekends, they arbitraged this behavioral calendar anomaly away, which is also quite a common uh, observation with many uh, anomalies that have been discovered across decades. As long as they are well known by market participants, they are arbitraged away and no longer present. So let's see whether the anomaly has completely disappeared since 1998. For that, we need to start at cell 7808, so the first trading day of 1998, and end at the final um, day of our sample. So let's just copy the template, paste it here, and instead of starting at the start, in 1967, we start in 1998. So we start in row 7808. And that gives us a coefficient that's very close to zero, and the t-stat is insignificant, with a p-value very close to 100%, meaning that the effect is pretty much non-existent. And if we control for the Monday effect, including column L, we'll see a very similar picture. Again, those um, coefficients are very close to zero, pretty much statistically indistinguishable from zero, with very high p-values, meaning that since 1998, the daylight saving anomaly in the United States is no longer there. And that can be either due to the sample choice of the original study, or due to post-publication decay and adaptive market efficiency. As soon as the market learns of the anomaly existing, again, keep in mind that this is a quite a uh, particular and uh, specific anomaly to exploit. We had to perform a lot of very specific data-related calculations to identify it in the original sample uh, leading to 1997. So perhaps traders needed the paper by Kamstra et al. to learn about this anomaly, arbitrage it away, and improve the efficiency of the market. And that's all there is with regards to the daylight savings anomaly on the US stock market, the way to detect and test it in Excel, and also what it means for adaptive market efficiency and research and empirical behavioral finance. Please leave a like on this video if you found it helpful. In the comments below, I am willing to see any further suggestions for videos in business, finance, or economics you would like me to record. And please don't forget to subscribe to our channel and support us on Patreon. Thank you very much, and stay tuned.